June 17th, 2016, when I was in uh, Shanghai at a, a friend's apartment, and it was about 15.30-something um, in the afternoon, I uh, saw a message uh, in one of the uh, Skype chats that I, was, that I was in, and someone basically saying, hey, guys, look at the Dow. It seems like there's some money coming out of it. And so I uh, checked um, on uh, the public block explorer on the blockchain, uh, and uh, I saw, oh, look, the, it seems like about $2 million uh, ETH has actually already been removed from the DAO, and uh, more ETH is kind of slowly being drained over time. Out to a company called Chain Analysis, and then asked them to keep following the trail. The hacker had taken the Bitcoins that they had received, it was about 282 Bitcoins, and they were using what's called a wasabi wallet, which is a type of mixer. And what I mean by that is that the Bitcoins get mixed together with a bunch of other people's Bitcoins. And then when the mixer spits them out on the other side, it's hard to follow the trail. So and previously thought to be impossible. Exactly. So what they found was that on the other side, the money did go to four exchanges. And at one of the exchanges, I did have a source who was able to find out what happened to the money that was deposited at that exchange? This is the story of the biggest heist on Ethereum, worth $60 million at that time. How just reversing the order of two lines of code would have prevented this attack? This is the story of Robinhood hackers that acted in time to rescue remaining funds. How the ultimate decision of hard folk raised several questions on the immutability of Ethereum blockchain. And it is a story of the birth of Ethereum Classic. So grab some snacks and tea, we are getting started on the intriguing real-life heist that happened on Ethereum. On June 17, 2016, around 4 million Ether were stolen from the DAO, worth around $60 million at that time. Now we will first talk about what the DAO is. A DAO stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization and it was created as a decentralized alternative to a venture fund. The smart contract representing the DAO was written by Slug.it company as an open source code. After the DAO was launched, it allowed people to deposit Ether and receive DAO tokens in exchange, which would let them vote on proposals created on the DAO and also get rewards if the proposal generated profits. The DAO was a huge success at the time and it managed to raise $150 million at that time. Now once a proposal is created, for the proposal to be approved, 20% of all the tokens had to be voted in its favor. Then the DAO automatically transfers Ether to the smart contract that represents the proposal. Now what if you disagree with the proposal and are in minority and don't want your Ether to be used for the proposal? You could simply use split DAO function and move Ether to a child DAO. Now we will talk about split DAO function in great detail in this video. So pay very careful attention to it since this is the weakest link and this is the function which was exploited to perform the DAO hack. Now to call this split DAO function, a split proposal had to be submitted and once one week of debate time passes, Ether can be moved to child DAO. This child DAO also had a lock-in period before Ether could be moved in a wallet and this lock-in period has ultimately proved to be a boon for Ethereum community since it gave the community time it needed to decide what to do next. Now I am pulling up a detailed article from Hacking Disturbed website and I'll give you link in the description which you can check out and read about the attack in more detail. Now funnily enough the vulnerability was already discovered and fixed in version 1.1 of the DAO. However, since the smart contract is immutable, the fix was part of version 1.1 of the DAO and existing DAO was still running vulnerable code. Now let's see what the attacker was up to. The attacker was analyzing DAO.soul file of the smart contract. And this file is also available on GitHub and I'll give you the link in the description so you can check out yourself. Now this is re entrancy attack and I have discussed it in greater detail in my previous video. So if you want to see this attack in action with code demo, I have already done in my previous video. I'll give you the link into the description so you can go and check it out. But in essence, what re-entrancy attack is that this function updates user balance and totals at the end. So if we can get any of the function calls before this happens to call split DAO again, we'll get infinite recursion that can be used to move as many funds as we want. Let's check this out. If you check this line, there is a withdraw reward for function. And if you take a look, what is inside withdraw reward for function? You can check that after few checks, it calls this payout function. 
and in payout you can see ultimately it is going to call recipient dot call dot value function and transfer the amount now if the recipient is a malaysia smart contract it can actually recursively call the split dao function so essentially attacker could perform this attack and keep on recursively calling this lines of code without ever updating its balance so that is in a sense reentrancy attack and as i already mentioned in my previous video i have described that in more greater detail so you can go and check it out you can also check it out in this link it is given in much more description how all the checks have passed and how it was possible to withdraw all these funds so let's see it step by step so first step was to propose a split and then wait until the voting period expires so let's talk about this split proposal now the split proposal can be initiated by any token holder time regarding their own ether however once initiated there is a schedule to be followed hard coded in dao's code according to which a split proposal must have at least one week of debate time so once a split proposal was created by the attacker attacker had to wait for one week to see approval but since it was just a split proposal like any other nobody will look at it closely and that's what happened in this case and after one week he could actually call the split function and move ether from the dao to the new child dao however there was a 27 days of split creation period during which no proposal can be brought forward and even after that if you try to send the funds in child dao to an account under your control you needed to submit a proposal and wait for 2 days which was 14 days so in a nutshell if you decide to split a dao and you try to move this funds to your wallet you need at least 48 days before getting it into your wallet now this time proved really beneficial for the ethereum community and it gave them the time to actually think through and came up with what needs to be done next whether to go with a hard fork or a soft fork or any other solution now let us discuss the hard fork so within ethereum community there was an intense debate as to what needs to be done to secure the stolen ether and there were three options that were available one was to do nothing and leaving the state as it is second was exercising a soft fork and third one was exercising a hard fork on ethereum blockchain now ultimately the option was to go ahead with a hard fork and there was a lot of debate again over going with hard fork or changing anything in the state of the ethereum blockchain so people argued that code was law and everything that the code allowed was legitimate additionally specifically against the hard fork option they claimed that the data on the blockchain was immutable it should be kept that way and doing the contrary would harm the ethereum blockchain in the long term these arguments were similar to those made by the attacker in the open letter so if you want to read more about what attacker had written in the open letter i'll give you the description in the link you can go and read it out Now interestingly enough there was a an angle of white hat hackers in these heists so while discussions were going on a group of white hat hackers referred to as robin hood tried to secure what was left in the dao and second to take what was drained by using the same exploit that was used by the attacker so even robin hood group tried to do the same things come up with a split proposal and try to move the remaining funds to the child dao Now it was said that attacker managed to even sneak in into this Robin Hood group and try to arrange another split attack once the split creation is over. However, Robin Hood's move had secured most of the remaining ether in a child dao and given the community additional time to implement another function such as a fork. Now ultimately the hard fork proposal was voted and accepted by majority of Ethereum community and the hard fork was completed and the funds were returned to the investors. Now the Ethereum hard fork did not prevent all the participants from following the old main branch. Thus the branch created with hard fork continued as Ethereum while the old branch kept going as Ethereum Classic and this was the birth of Ethereum Classic. Now at the end I would also like to talk about the big shot and this is a very interesting angle to this whole heist. Now around this time when the smart contract exploit happened there was a 3 million ethereum short that occurred on bitfinex just moment before the attack claiming this short closed with almost 1 million usd in profit 
as it is obvious that anybody performing an attack would obviously know that they have to wait through the creation period of 27 days and this is definitely going to give the community the time to respond to a theft. So any financially motivated attacker would have attempt their exploit to ensure regardless of a potential rollback or fog by shorting the underlying token. So the staggering drop that resulted within minutes of smart contract that triggered the malicious split provided an excellent profit opportunity. So while there is no proof that this was performed by the attacker, but it looks pretty likely that this effort was being made by the attacker. Okay, so there are a lot many things about the attacker that you can go and read about in this great article on hackingdisturb.com. At, at the end, I'll just show you a contract address which is attackers and we can see there are a lot of transactions for 100 ether you can see this is 102 ether 102 ether all getting withdrawn in the attackers address now there had been analysis being done on who the attacker might be and the generalist Laura Shin has done some analysis on the hacker trails and found it to be Toby horn size Australian programmer even though Toby has denied all the Laura's claims so I'll give you the link of this article in the description and also I'll give you a video link where Laura explains how exactly she came about this conclusion. So you can go and check it out from the description. And that is it for this video folks. Hope you all enjoyed this video. If you did, please give a like to this video, subscribe to my channel and I'll catch you in the next video. Bye bye.